Hello again. In this video, I'm going to talk about privative clauses. What these clauses have in common with statutory rights of appeal, which I will deal with more briefly in my next mini lecture, is that their inclusion in an administrative law statute represents a direction by the legislature that enacted it as to the extent of oversight of administrative bodies that it expects the courts to have. I will go into the history of the modern law in some detail, but the law has significantly shifted by recent decisions. So this lecture is really the story of how we got to the position. In my last pre-recorded lecture, I defined a privative clause as a clause giving the administrative body alone the power to decide disputes arising under statute. It might be helpful at this stage to consider an example, one of which can be found in Section 22 of the Saskatchewan Workers' Compensation Act of 1979. It says, The Board shall have exclusive jurisdiction to examine, hear and determine all matters and questions arising under this Act and any other matter in respect of which a power, authority or discretion is conferred upon the Board. The decision and finding of the Board under this Act upon all questions of fact and law are final and conclusive, and no proceedings by or before the Board's seal may be restrained by injunction, prohibition or other proceeding, or removable by certiorari or otherwise in any court. This is a fairly standard form of wording in Canadian and provincial statutes, and it consists of a number of clauses. The first sentence is called an exclusive jurisdiction clause because it confers on the board the exclusive jurisdiction over certain matters. The first part of the second sentence is called a finality clause because it says that the decision of the board is final. And in the textbook we use Van Harten et al., the second part of the second sentence, beginning with no proceedings, is called a strong privative clause, although we may, following English law usage, call this an ouster clause, because on its face it ousts the jurisdiction of the courts. We will see, though, that in fact it does not do what on its face it appears to do. The question that we are ultimately most concerned with in this lecture is the effect that privative clauses have on the standard of review, as I called it in the previous lecture. That is, what impact do they have on whether the reviewing court applies a correctness standard or a reasonableness standard, as the more deferential standard is now known? The short answer is that, as a result of the Vavilov decision, the situation is now much different from how it was before. I will get to that, but I will take you through the evolution of Canadian law as it departed from the tradition of English administrative law in order to show how we have arrived at the current position, which may not in fact be the end of the line. Originally, the courts approached privative clauses through the lens of the concept of jurisdiction. An administrative agency or tribunal is said to have been given jurisdiction to determine certain matters, but there are also limits to its jurisdiction. It is easy to think of geographical limits to jurisdiction. The British Columbia Securities Commission has the jurisdiction to regulate firms traded on the Vancouver Stock Exchange, but not in Toronto, for example. But there are other kinds of conceptual limits. As Lord Reed defined the term in the English case of Annis Minnick, jurisdiction relates to the question of the tribunal being entitled to enter on the inquiry in question. And the theory was that if the tribunal acted within its jurisdiction, it was dis entitled to, to decide the matter, even if it decided wrongly. And for errors within jurisdiction, the effect of a preclusive clause that was, was that the court could not intervene to correct the error of the tribunal under its supervision. But if errors were made out with jurisdiction, the preclusive clause would not save the inferior tribunal's decision. 
because it had no jurisdiction to make that decision in the first place. But in his judgment, Lord Reed added, but there are many cases where, although the tribunal had jurisdiction to enter on the inquiry, it has done or failed to do something in the course of its inquiry, which is of such a nature that its decision is a nullity. It may have given its decision in bad faith, it may have made a decision which it had no power to make. It may have failed in the course of the inquiry to comply with the requirements of natural justice. It may in perfect good faith have misconstrued the provisions giving it power to act so that it failed to deal with the question remitted to it and decided some question that was not remitted to it. It may have refused to take into account something which it was required to take into account or it may have based a decision on some matter which, under the provisions setting it up, it had no right to take into account. In other words, this was not quite the simple matter of determining what sort of questions the body subject to judicial review had been empowered to decide. It must also have decided them in the right way, whether that meant complying with essential procedural requirements or various substantive errors, like taking irrelevant considerations into account and making a decision. Complying with such requirements were said to be preliminary matters, and if an administrative body erred in its understanding of those preliminary matters, it was said to have taken itself outside its jurisdiction at which point the preclusive clause no longer protected it. And this complication caused difficulties, because although the distinction arguably made sense at an abstract and conceptual level, in practice there were, as the majority put it in Vavilov, no clear markers to distinguish a preliminary or jurisdictional question from a non-jurisdictional one. And this allowed judges in judicial review to justify intervening if they disapproved of an administrative decision, because phrased in the right way, almost any question of statutory interpretation could be phrased as a preliminary jurisdictional question. Equally, the judges could decline to intervene by declaring the matter to be non-jurisdictional. There is a lovely quote from Lord Denning in an English case called Perlman and keepers of governors of Harrow School. Lord Denning said, So fine is the distinction that in truth the High Court has a choice before it whether to intervene with an inferior court on a point of law. If it chooses to intervene, it can formulate its decision in the words, The court below had no jurisdiction to decide the point wrongly as it did. If it does not choose to interfere, it can say the court had a jurisdiction to decide it wrongly, and it did so. Softly be it stated, but that is the reason for the difference between the decisions of the Court of Appeal in Annis Minnick and the House of Lords. Actually, that is a bit unfair in my view, as you will know if you've read the conclusions to my book. But in any case, the English Lords settled the matter in a 1985 case called O'Reilly and Macman, which effectively decided that the implication of Annis Minnick was that all errors of law go to jurisdiction. So in effect, no decisions of inferior tribunals on matters of law are protected from interference by the court. The Canadian courts, much to their credit in my view, jumped in the other direction. As we saw in the previous video, in QP, the courts retained the concept of jurisdiction, but tried to approach it from the point of view of the substantive justification for preclusive clauses, rather from a formal analysis that attached central importance to the limits of the boundaries of jurisdiction. Considerations such as the relative expertise of the administrative body and although the courts never quite put it in terms like this, the commitment of bodies such as the National Labour Relations Board to collective and cooperative approaches to labour regulation figured amongst these, as did considerations like speed and finality of decision-making, 
access to a form of justice that was accessible and affordable, and so on. These considerations all indicated a standard of manifest unreasonableness, as we have seen. But these considerations had to be balanced against the protection of the rule of law. And so in QP, the concept of jurisdiction and errors of law going to jurisdiction was retained. The Supreme Court of Canada, in later cases, tried to narrow the concept of jurisdictional error by speaking in terms of true jurisdiction to distinguish its preferred approach from earlier cases in which the concept of jurisdiction was stretched to cover pretty much any interpretation of law that a court wanted to strike down. Questions of true jurisdiction would be subject to correctness review, while other questions within jurisdiction would be subject to a patent unreasonableness review. In place of the earlier, more formalist approach, the Supreme Court of Canada urged an approach which was, as Justice Beats puts it in the case of Bebo, pragmatic and functional. In other words, the courts would consider whether there were reasons for the courts to defer to the interpretation of the agency, and would weigh and balance these against the rule of law concerns in order to arrive at a decision as to the appropriate test. A complication was that the number of standards was proliferating. In between the patent unreasonableness standard and the correctness standard, Justice Jacobucci discovered an intermediate standard called reasonableness simpliciter, a standard of review that was more intensive than patent unreasonableness, but which still fell short of a full correctness review. And the number of tests or standards might have proliferated further into four or five if the Supreme Court of Canada had not knocked suggestions to that effect on its head. This question of which standard should apply and the relationship between that question and the issue of jurisdiction was reconsidered in the case of Pushpanathan versus Canada. Pushpanathan concerned the interpretation of a provision of Canada's Immigration Act which prevented people from claiming refugee status if they were, in the words of the statute, guilty of acts contrary to the purpose of the United Nations. The provision was enacted to give effect to a provision on the UN Convention relating to the status of refugees. Pushpanathan made a claim for refugee status in Canada but he had been convicted in Canada of conspiracy to traffic narcotics. And on that basis, and purportedly in accordance with the provision of the Immigration Act we have just discussed, his refugee claim was refused. So the question before the court was whether the Minister of Immigration, in practice a civil servant acting on his behalf, had acted within his powers in deciding that a criminal conviction for drug trafficking in the country in which he claimed refugee status could justify the conclusion that Pushpanathan had engaged in acts contrary to the purposes of the United Nations. What is important about the case for our present purposes is how the court approached, or perhaps more accurately avoided the question of jurisdiction in relation to the ouster clause issue. A question of jurisdiction, the court said, is simply descriptive of a provision for which the proper standard of review is correctness, based upon the outcome of the pragmatic and functional analysis. The existence of a privative clause was just one of four factors to be balanced. The others were the expertise of the decision maker, the purpose of the statute as a whole, and the provision in particular, whether the question was a question of fact, law, or a mixed question of fact and law. We will talk about those factors in due course, but for now the important thing to remember is that the existence of a privative clause wasn't determinative of the standard of review to be applied. It was one of four factors to be balanced in the pragmatic and functional analysis. One reason why this was the case, why a privative clause couldn't be considered determinative of the standard of review, 
arises as an implication of Canada's federal constitution. This can be seen from the case of Crevier. The background to that case was the province of Quebec enacted a professional code which created a tribunal, the professions tribunal, to hear appeals from the disciplinary commissions of various professional disciplinary bodies, bodies which regulate the medical and dental professions and the like. The issue was that judges on the professions tribunal were not appointed by the governor general, as was the case for appointments to the superior courts under section 96 of the Constitution Act 1867. Moreover, a privative clause on its face excluded the decisions of the professions tribunal from the review of the superior courts. On its face, Section 96 seems to be not particularly potent. It states that the Governor General shall appoint judges of the superior district and county courts in each province, except those of the courts of probate in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Nothing much can be inferred, as John's Wills put it in 1940, from an unstructured reading of this section. But as Chief Justice Bora Laskin put it in Crevier, it would make a mockery of the 1867 Act to treat Section 96 in non-functional formal terms as a mere appointing power. By giving an unreviewable power to the Professions Tribunal to determine the limits of its jurisdiction without appeal or review, Chief Justice Laskin held that the Quebec legislature was trying to give the tribunal the powers of a superior court, thus usurping the proper role of the Canadian Superior Courts and the Governor-General. The Supreme Court of Canada was not, in, in that circumstance, prepared to cure this problem by reading the privative clause narrowly, as, as it had done in numerous other cases. Instead, the relevant provisions of the professional code were struck down as unconstitutional. This brings us to the cases that we will consider in our workshop, Dunsmuir and Vavilov. The court in Dunsmuir sought to simplify the approach of pragmatic and functional analysis, which it rebadged simply as standard of review analysis. But on the issue of privative clauses, it mostly just confirmed the state of the law as it had so far developed. A privative clause was, according to the majority, a statutory direction from Parliament or a legislature indicating the need for deference. As to the effect of such a direction, I would like you to pause the video now and read just paragraph 52 of the decision in Dunsmuir. For your convenience, it can be found at the bottom of page 654 of the textbook, Van Harten et al. Take your time to digest that paragraph. Okay, I am now assuming that you have read paragraph 52 of Dunsmuir. Two points can be gleaned from it. First, the existence of a preclusive clause gives rise to what the majority called a strong indication that the test is one of reasonableness. But second, that the presence of a privative clause, even if it gives rise to a strong indication, is still not determinative. The Supreme Court of Canada in Dunsmuir stopped short of saying that the existence of a preclusive clause gave rise to a presumption of deference. This was criticised by the dissenting judgment of Justice Binney, which can be found in paragraph 143 of Dunsmuir, which again I would like you to pause the video and read. It is extracted around the middle of page 655 of the textbook. Again, I am now assuming that you have read paragraph 143. Justice Binney argues that while a privative clause is not determinative, it should be more than just one consideration 
to be balanced in the pragmatic and functional analysis, or the standard of review analysis, as it should now be called. Justice Binney argues that the existence of a preclusive clause should presumptively foreclose judicial review, unless that presumption can be somewhat how rebutted. Obviously, a situation like Crevier is one that he has in mind. So at this point, I hope you can see certain fault lines emerging. On the one hand, you have those like Justice Binney, who emphasise parliamentary sovereignty as an overriding constitutional principle, albeit subject to some long-stop considerations. Limitations on parliamentary sovereignty arising from federalism would be one such consideration. On the other hand, you have the position of the majority, who see things more in terms of a balance between parliamentary sovereignty and rival considerations, such as the rule of law. In this balancing act, no one constitutional principle takes precedence. Now this finally takes us to the recent case of Vavilov. This is a hugely important case, as well as quite a long one. And by the time you finish this module, you will have read the entire thing in detail. But for now, I just want to highlight the relevance of the decision in relation to privative clauses. Dunsmuir sought to simplify the standard of review analysis. But as the court put it in Vavilov at paragraph 7, it has become clear that Dunsmuir's promise of simplicity and predictability in this respect has not been fully realised. The breakthrough in Vavilov was the one that Justice Binney anticipated. This can be seen in paragraph 10 of Vavilov, which you should now read. Pause your video and come back to it after you have read paragraph 10. So, as you have now seen, as a result of Vavilov, pragmatic and functional analysis is no longer. Instead, the reviewing court will in future proceed from the presumption that the applicable standard is one of reasonableness, and an established set of criteria to indicate where this presumption can be rebutted. So where does this leave privative clauses? What effect do they now have on the standard of review? Now, you might guess that this in fact leaves no practical role for privative clauses. As a result of Dunsmuir and other prior case law, their importance was that privative clauses were seen by the court as an indication that they should exercise deference and apply the reasonableness standard. But if reasonableness presumptively now applies, then what practical effect do they have? The answer to this question would be appear to be given by paragraph 49 of the judgment of the court in Vavilov. As the court puts it, in a framework that is based on a presumption of reasonableness review, contextual factors that courts once looked to as signalling deferential review, such as privative clauses, serve no independent or additional function in identifying the standard of review. This position was criticised in the concurring judgment of Justices Abella and Karkatsanis. This can be found on paragraph 248 of the decision, and I do recommend you take a couple of minutes now to read that. This brings me to the end of my pre-recorded lecture treatment of privative or preclusive clauses. I am sure some of this has been a little confusing. Indeed, a big part of the motivation for the reconsideration of the law in Vavilov and before that Dunsmuir was precisely that these issues proved confusing to lower courts called upon to apply their standard of review analysis. But you may also be struggling with the fact that I have so far given a partial view of the question of the standard of review. I promise that things will fit together better once you can see the fuller picture a little better, as you will as the module progresses. What I hope you have got 
It's a sense of the journey which the Supreme Court of Canada has taken. And with my treatment of Dunsmuir and Vavilov, I hope you're beginning to see that the journey has not been a smooth one all in one direction. I started this part of the story of Canadian administrative law by talking about the emergence of an approach which was based on a rejection of the formal rationality of the English courts. But the substantive rationality of functional and pragmatic analysis of the Supreme Court of Canada has also proved to have difficulty. In particular, it tended to draw attention to the question of which test to apply and away from the underlying substantive issues of the case. In Vavilov, the Supreme Court of Canada has drawn a line under the era of functional and pragmatic analysis. This does not mean that the court has become full circle, but it has seen the attractions of a partial return to formalism. The chief advantage of which, as Fred Schauer has said, is that it directs decision makers to leave out of consideration things that they might otherwise consider. In this case, it directs the courts to just attend to the presumptions and the limited exceptions to those presumptions that it has outlined rather than engaging in a deep and case-specific inquiry into a range of contextual factors. If you have time to do any reading on the side, I do recommend Fred Schauer's book, Thinking Like a Lawyer. I don't agree with it at all, I have to say, but it is an excellent apology of the formalist approach. In the meantime, I will see you in the next lecture on statutory rights of appeal.